Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Well, following our outline through the book of Leviticus, this is the final section here. This is the end of the chiasm, focusing on festivities and celebrations. There's some other things in there. There's going to be a concluding uh, section that we will look at. But most of this is talking about the, the celebrations that children of Israel were to celebrate. And it's fitting, remember the chiastic structure pivots in the middle. What began with sacrifice and coming to the Lord solemnly and offering the blood to dwell in his presence is going to end with the celebration in the same holy place. So you can see how this has been outlined for us. And this chapter is all about the appointed feasts. And this word for appointed feast, it's only one word in Hebrew. It's the word moed. And it just means appointment, which I think is kind of fun. Says, These are my appointments. You've got appointments to keep with me, says the Lord. And of course, appointed feast is a perfectly fine translation because that is exactly what we're going to talk about. This is the Jewish calendar year established by the Lord at Mount Sinai. Now, these festivals are still kept by the Jews, although in dramatically altered forms. We're going to look tonight at some of the, of course, the scriptures and Old and New Testament together. We're also going to look at some of the traditions that the Jews follow to this day and that were picked up in between the Testaments and that sort of thing, because you can see that these have a remarkable, prophetic, Christological significance to them. And even as we look at some of the things that the Jews do to this day, you're going to, you're going to be like me, I would expect, and be like, how can you miss this? It's all about Jesus. Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have life, but these are they which testify of who? Me, me he said. Jesus we're going to read pretty soon in Romans that all these things were written down beforehand for our instruction. The entire Hebrew year was to be one of remembrance and celebration. That could be a study on its own, that the Lord has an entire chapter giving the people seven different parties to attend. So the idea that being sober and solemn is the only way to worship the Lord is entirely foreign to Scripture, isn't it? But what he's also doing, by, by putting these throughout the whole year, mostly at the, at the beginning of the harvest and the end of the harvest, the, the spring and the fall, he's bringing the whole year under his authority. And some of these festivals would have been things they kind of celebrated already, but God takes this calendar and attaches dramatic theological significance to it. I do want to say, as we get into these, because they can be very exciting, and we can start to feel bad about some of this stuff, we can start to feel fascinated by some of the Jewish traditions, I will read this at the beginning and the end. I want to remind you of something Paul said in Colossians 2, 16 and 17. He said, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. He specifically tells us, don't let anybody judge you about the festivals. These, he said, are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So if you are in Christ Jesus, you are, in a biblical New Testament sense, keeping the festival. So don't let strange people on the internet make you feel bad and feel like you're not going to heaven for not keeping the Feast of Booths or something like that. Well, let's go through them. There are seven of these. Really, there are six festivals and, and one special day, which we'll, we'll look at the festival that it was tied to next time. And that is the first one, which is the Sabbath, verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. Now, we've already discussed the Sabbath in great detail several times uh, so we're not going to get into it too deeply again because I want to get to the rest of it. But I'll just remind you, the Sabbath is following God's example in resting on the seventh day after creation. That's Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. By the way, there's going to be a lot of scripture flying fast and furious tonight. So if you're taking notes, you should, you should be ready for that. I tried to put as much of it on the slides as I could, but I didn't get it all. So the Sabbath day is Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. This was a day primarily, and Jesus will draw this out a lot, primarily for rest. But you can see it was also for a holy convocation. 
So this is where the tradition of the synagogues would grow up. And by the time we get to Jesus, it was ossified into something that needed to be shaken up. But it was still, of course, a good thing. Now, as we discuss these holy days, he says you're going to have a Sabbath every, what we'd call Saturday. And you will also see that in the six feasts that follow, there were seven extra Sabbath days throughout the year. You can follow and try to count them as we go through if you like. Seven special Sabbaths. The number seven is pretty significant uh, in the Hebrew calendar, as it is in ours. Our week is seven days, of course. And Jesus, as I said, had a lot to say about the Sabbath, especially the legalistic demands of the Pharisees. He said, what are we supposed to do on the Sabbath? Well, there you go, right there in verse 3. But they had books and books and encyclopedias of requirements for the Sabbath day. But Jesus reminded us that it was to be a gift and that he himself had authority over the Sabbath. Because remember, as Paul said, the substance of these things is Christ. In Mark 2, 27 and 28, Jesus said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He's saying, the Sabbath day is your day off. And you've turned it into something that everybody dreads. Because, as in certain traditions that we have today, you have to pre-tear your toilet paper. Because if you, if you tear it on the Sabbath day, you're violating the Sabbath. Jesus is like, you've taken the Sabbath and made it into this gigantic headache for everybody. When I made this to be something for you, and something for your hired workers, and something for your animals, and for your fields. The Sabbath was primarily a mark of distinction for the Jews. Which is also one of the reasons why the Lord does not require the Sabbath of his New Testament Christians. Because it is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 4 spends a whole chapter talking about how Jesus Christ is our Sabbath rest. How cool is that? I'll read verses 9 and 10. He said, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. The writer to the Hebrews is reminding these Hebrew Christians who are tempted to go back to the law. He's saying, why would you want to go back to keeping the old Sabbath and relying on it for salvation when you've entered into God's once for all Sabbath named Messiah Jesus? So entering into the rest of Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. It's the goal of all creation, you might say. Why did we have to have a Sabbath every week when God only had one? Because we were in our sins. But now that God's work has been completed at the cross, we can enter into that rest once and for all. I've taken other times to go through the study of the Sabbath in greater detail, so we'll move on to verses 4 through 8. This one might take a minute. Verses 4 through 8. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. But you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. So the first proper feast, we just looked at the Sabbath, which is included in the list but really, until we get to the Sabbath year and the year of Jubilee in the following chapters, uh, it's just going to leave it as that one day. So we come to the Passover. In Hebrew, this is Pesach. So if you've ever known a Jewish friend of yours and they reference Pesach, that's what this is. You maybe have heard Jesus referred to as the Paschal Lamb before. It's related to that etym etymologically. And this is discussed in Exodus chapter 12. And we looked at this in detail on how the ceremonies would go. This is when they took the blood of the lamb. They spread it on the doorposts and the angel of death passed them over. And, and that's where the name comes from, Passover. This would take per place, it says, in the first month, which for them was the month of Nisan. This is around March, April for us in our calendar. And this would, would kick off the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So you'd have Passover, and then the next day would begin the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I believe in the past I may have gotten that backwards. So let me, I, if I haven't done so already, let me offer a correction to that. There it says it was Passover and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would last a week. So for that reason, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread could be spoken of in one breath. So they would say the week of Passover, even though Passover was one day. I think you can see how that uh, would relate to it, kind of like the 12 days of Christmas, which I don't know where those came from, but it's, it, it's a helpful illustration anyhow. 
And there was to be a Sabbath rest on the first and seventh days of unleavened bread, which is why when Jesus was crucified on Good Friday, which was the day of Passover, and was put in the tomb, they had to leave him in the tomb the next day because it was the Sabbath day, which was always the case that the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Holy Saturday in this case, was a Sabbath day, also on the eighth day. So there's your first two extra Sabbaths. They were to eat the lamb, they were to eat unleavened bread and bitter herbs and drink wine to remember the blood of the lamb that kept the plague outside when they were getting ready to flee Egypt. That's where unleavened bread came from in the first place. He said, you're not going to have time for your bread to rise. Just cook it and make some flat bread, pack your stuff and eat it with it on your back so that you can just go when the word comes. Now, of course, it's very easy to see the symbolism of Jesus Christ in the festival of Passover, isn't it? Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. He was the one who died so that death would pass over us. He was the firstborn son who died so that we did not have to die. Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So in case you had any doubts about that, the New Testament understood that. Now, he says, cleanse out the old leaven in that verse because our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Now, that's a verse that if you're a Gentile like myself, you might not get it right away. But this is where we start to get into some of the traditions that were followed for the Passover. If you've ever been to a Seder meal before, some of this will be familiar to you. And I'll try to do as best I can in the time that we have. This corresponds to the tradition where they would get all the leaven out of the house. You had to go through that house and make sure there was no leaven in it, and it became a game for the kids to try to get the leaven out. And this is what Paul is saying. You likewise, leaven, yeast is a symbol of sin. He says, purge it out of your life. Get rid of that because your Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Meaning if you're living in the light and the reality of Passover day by day, there's no room for sin or leaven in your house or your life. Now when we start looking at the Last Supper, and we realize that the Last Supper was a Passover meal, Luke twenty two eleven, 11, right? Jesus said, go out and prepare a place where I can eat the Passover. Shows us a little more. Now, real quick, a little timing thing here. We say, wait a minute, if Jesus was crucified on Friday and he ate the Passover meal, which was supposed to be on a Friday, how did we have time? Well, what did we just say? On twilight. The days were reckoned, according to this festival calendar, by evening to evening. So Thursday night, as they reckoned days, would have begun Friday. That's when it started, because the, the day is over, so we've started the new one. So it's really not that complicated, but if you're thinking like we think, from sunrise to sunrise, which is how we tend to do it, it can be confusing. But let's look at the Last Supper. There are four cups of wine that are traditionally drunk during the Passover meal. And Jesus would have drunk these four. He would have followed this Ritual. This is not in scripture, but it was picked up in the intertestamental period, meaning between Malachi and Matthew, these traditions came about. And y'all, it blows my mind every time I talk about this, because this is still done. And there is so much to unpack out of this that it's, it's, um, it's I'll just get into it. So you have four cups. If you're taking notes, you got four. The first one is called the cup of sanctification. Now, we know what this means, the cup of setting apart, right? It's remembering that the children of Israel were set apart from the other nations. And this would be eaten with the first round of bitter herbs. There were several ceremonial times you'd eat those bitter herbs, which were a symbol of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. And the first thing that the head of the meal would do is he would go through a ceremonial washing of the hands. At the beginning of the Last Supper, what did Jesus wash? It's not a true question. His disciples' feet. Isn't that awesome? Jesus, as the head of the, of the table, rather than doing something that claimed honor for himself, he gets down and he girds himself with a towel and begins to wash their feet. At the time when you normally would have, he would have been taking the honor to himself and washing his hands, he washed their feet, John 13, 5. Now, this is when it gets cool. After the, sup, the cup of sanctification was drunk, there was a bag there of three unbroken matzahs. If you've ever helped us prepare for communion before, you know that the matzah bread come in those, those squares, right? And there would be three of those unbroken in a single bag, and they would have to remain separated from one another. This bag was called the echad, which means one in Hebrew. Are you, are you tracking me with me? Somebody's tracking me here. You have three matzahs 
in the bag that could not touch each other. They were distinct, and they were separated from one another. But the bag was called the echad, which means one. Now, the word echad in Hebrew is a word that can mean a compound unity, a trinity, you might say. <laughs> All right. Now, you're with me, okay? Now, check this part out. After you've drunk the cup of sanctification, they were to reach into the bag, into the, the echad, the bag of, of matzahs. Take the second one out and break it. Yeah, I'm not making this up. This is real. They would take half of it. They would hide it in a white cloth, and that would be made later. The second one would be broken, not the first and not the third. We'll be back to that in a second. <laughs> Next, you move on to the second cup, which is the cup of the plagues. This is when they would, again, drink the cup. They would pass it around. Everybody would, would sip it. And then they would eat a piece of matzah that was, I read this, was supposed to be dipped in a, kind of a sauce or whatever with the bitter herbs in it that was supposed to be so bitter that it brings a tear to his eye. That's how you know it's bitter enough. And this was to then be passed around. At this stage of the Last Supper, this is when Jesus said, one of you will surely betray me. And they all began to ask each other, I said, Lord, is it me? Lord, is it me? And what did Jesus say? It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread after I have dipped it in the bitter herbs that was supposed to bring a tear to his eye. And he handed it to Judas. After that, now remember, Judas leaves immediately, right? After that, they were supposed to take a second piece that was dipped in a sweet mix of apples and spices, now that he's just there with the other 11. That's supposed to symbolize that even in the bitterness, there's sweetness that comes from it. And if you've ever uh, watched the Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille's movie, or if you've ever been to a Seder meal, maybe you grew up Jewish, I don't know. This is when the four questions are asked you know the four questions, and they're all with the refrain, why is this night different from all other nights? This is when the meal proper would be eaten. They would eat, the, and this, now in these days, they add an egg to the meal that's supposed to represent the temple that was destroyed. They have a bone of the lamb because they're not sacrificing lambs anymore. And that's when the children go out, and they're supposed to look for that broken piece of matzah, for them to be taken out of the bag and broken and put somewhere in the house. And this is a game for the kids, maybe for the, give the parents a chance to digest a little bit, I suppose. And they're supposed to find it and bring it back. Now, when they find it and bring it back, they're given a reward. It's broken, and everybody gets a piece. And after they've eaten that bread, they eat the third cup, which is called the cup of redemption. So keeping that in mind, so you find the piece of the second set of the, of the one that had been broken. You bring it back. You break that apart. You drink the cup of redemption. Matthew 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is what? My body. What piece of bread was that? It was the second piece in the bag of three that had been broken and taken away. Take, eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, which according to the tradition is the cup of what now? Redemption. Redemption. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, said, drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is pretty wild, isn't it? <laughs> And the fourth one is called the cup of praise. Now, here's something else that would be done and is still, in fact, done. There was always to be an empty chair at the table. Who was the chair for? Does anybody know? Elijah. Elijah. You ever see that scene in The Chosen where she sets out a chair for Elijah and she's not supposed to because it's a Sabbath day and then she opens the door and Jesus has come and he sits down in the chair? You see, yeah, that's smart people, right? <laughs> Now, why do they do this? Because Malachi, the end of the book of, of the Old Testament, Malachi 4 verse 5 says, I will send to you Elijah before the day of the Lord comes. So by having an empty seat at the table, what they're saying is Elijah didn't come this year. But do you know what they say? How do they end it? What do they say? Next year in Jerusalem. Maybe Elijah will come next year. Now, what did, what did, who did Jesus say Elijah was when the disciples asked him about it? John the Baptist. And in John 1, when he saw Jesus coming towards him, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Isn't this glorious to see that? 
And it makes you wonder how someone can go through that and not realize, not only do you have Jesus there, not only is John the Baptist there, not only is the Last Supper there, the Trinity is there. Like, it's all there. And that was developed before the church ever developed the doctrine of the Trinity. We realized that one later. We're looking at, like, it looks like God is three in one and one in three. That, I, compound unity. I don't know. And it turns out, all along, here have been the Hebrews celebrating Passover with a compound unity and breaking the second one. And that when Jesus did that, he said, this is my body. Amen. And when they drank the cup of redemption, he said, this is my blood. Do you see why you need to know the whole Bible? Amen. Jesus is our Passover lamb. And not only how great is it for us to see this, how tragic is the blindness of God's chosen people. So how can they miss this? Do you know why? Because the Bible says God has hardened their hearts until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. But every time we gather together for communion, and we take the bread and we take that cup, we're proclaiming and remembering the Lord Jesus until he comes. And when he comes, as we will see tonight, that's going to be when the blindness lifts. So that's, that's Passover. That's Pesach. That's number two. It's the first proper feast. And the second one we're going to see in verses 9 through 14. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma. And the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hin. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain parched or fresh until this same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And the second feast is the feast of first fruits. This was celebrated the first Sabbath after Passover. So there is overlap here between the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits and Passover were all part of this, this long celebration. Now, what they would do is they would go to their fields. This was for the barley harvest. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. The barley harvest. And they were to gather one sheaf. So just one sheaf of barley and bring that to the tabernacle. And it was a wave offering. We've talked about the wave offering. So they would wave them before the Lord. And they were to offer a burnt offering, which we discussed before, a grain offering, and a drink offering. And a drink offering is not specifically outlined of how you did it in the book of Leviticus, but the short answer is that you would pour it out. Paul would talk about himself being poured out as a drink offering unto the Lord. Also, they were not to eat any bread or any kind of cereal product until they had made this offering. It seems to be of that day. The idea being, don't wait, get up early and go get it done. Now, if you're keeping track, you can see this pattern here. Friday was the Passover meal. Saturday was the Sabbath day, and it also was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And on Sunday was the Feast of First Fruits. And if you are following me, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead on the day of the Feast of First Fruits. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and, and I'll read verse 23. Let's read these with fresh understanding now. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits. And then in his coming, those who belong to Christ. We read that and go, that's pretty cool, Paul. Where'd you come up with that? And Paul goes, it's in your Bible, dude. You got to read it. The first fruits. Have you ever wondered why in 1 Corinthians 5, 4, it says that Christ was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures? And then you search your Old Testament trying to find a place where it says on the third day. Now, there's a place in Hosea that seems to be related to that. But the short answer is this. Passover is on Friday. Sabbath day is on Saturday. First fruits is on Sunday. That's the scriptures that Jesus was raised according to on the third day. First fruits. Now, why is that cool? Because just as Jesus was the first to be raised, and just as the sheaf brought was the first of the harvest, we also believe that we too will be raised with him. 
Jesus was not the last one to be raised from the dead. He was the first one to be raised from the dead. And in between and after Jesus, you have what? A harvest. And Jesus said, the fields are white unto harvest, so pray the Lord to send laborers into the harvest. We believe that we will be raised with him, and we say, when? When the harvest is over. The times in which we live now. So for those that feel we are not Jewish enough for worshiping on Sunday instead of Saturday, say, well, we do that because of the Feast of First Fruits. We're commemorating the fulfillment. We're not looking forward to what God's going to do. We're looking back at what he did and celebrating. So First Fruits is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right, verses 15 through 22. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two-tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven, with leaven this time, as first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. The third feast here is the Feast of Weeks, but you probably know it by its Greek name, which is Pentecost. Seven weeks after first fruits, they were to have the Feast of Weeks on the 50th day. That's where the name Pentecost comes from. They were to bring in here the first fruits, but not of the barley harvest. This time it's of the wheat harvest. So if you're taking notes, you can write that down. And they were to come and bring, first of all, a grain offering, which was two loaves of bread with leaven in them this time, which is why they were waved and not burned up on the altar. Also, they were to offer seven lambs, one bull, and two rams as a burnt offering. That would have been representative for all the people. So everybody brings two loaves of bread, and then there's these animals for everybody. A goat for a sin offering, and then two lambs as peace offerings. Pentecost, we read, was also to be a day of Sabbath in which no work was done. So if you're tracking with me here, the first and final days of unleavened bread were to be special Sabbath days, as was Pentecost. And there's also a reminder stuck there in verse 22, not to harvest the whole field. We've already talked about this. Now, why is it being put in there again? Because he's reminding them, don't come and celebrate my harvest if you have not kept the laws of the harvest. Nobody is to go hungry on the day of Pentecost or any day, but he offers it there as a good reminder. Traditionally, Pentecost was a celebration of the giving of the law. I think we discussed this in Exodus, that it was about 50 days from Egypt when they arrived at Mount Sinai and God gave Moses the law. And I don't need to build up to it. You all know what happened on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, don't you? Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all filled with the Spirit. So, Pentecost was a celebration of the giving of the law. But in the New Testament, we are told that we do not serve by the letter of the law, but by the Spirit who gives life. The Lord said, my new covenant, I'm going to write my law where? Jason prayed it during worship. Where is he going to write the law? On your hearts. So this was, in a sense, a second, better giving of the law. 
where the letter itself was closed. The dispensation was over. And the Lord put something new in the hearts of the people. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6 says, The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Amen. And speaking of the letter killing and the Spirit giving life, how else was this like Sinai? Well, of course, like at Mount Sinai, there was wind and there was fire and there were voices coming out. But this time, not just one nation, but every nation was brought into God's new covenant. Also, speaking of the letter killing and the spirit giving life, do you remember what the Levites had to do when they were worshiping the golden calf? They had to go through and violently put a stop to the worship. And 3,000 men were killed that day. When Peter preached his sermon at the day of Pentecost, how many men were saved? At 3,000. The letter kills, the spirit gives life. Isn't that awesome? Praise the Lord. This was the birthday of the church. These are the two loaves, the Jews and the Gentiles, being brought together into God's family. Why do they have leaven? Because we're still sinful, but God has accepted us anyway. Praise the Lord, right? That's Pentecost. Now, when we get to this part here, so we've looked at Passover and the unleavened bread. It's all rolled into one. Passover, first fruits, and Pentecost. These are the springtime feasts. Now, the next three are going to be the fall feasts. In between, you would have had the summertime. And it's also very interesting and prophetically significant, I think, that the first three things God did are separated by a long stretch of time before the next three things that God's going to do. Let's look at this. Verses 23 through 25. This is a short one. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, so we were in the first month, now we're in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, there's another one, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. This is the Feast of Trumpets. It is also known by its more common Hebrew name, which is Rosh Hashanah. This is the Hebrew New Year. That stands for the chief or the head of the year. That's what that means in Hebrew. But it's also called the Feast of Trumpets. This would have been celebrated in the Hebrew month of Tishrei, which is around September, October by our calendar. And we're really not given a lot of details about the Feast of Trumpets. This is the first in what contemporary Judaism calls the High Holy Days, and they tend to celebrate creation on that day, among other things, though. They also will, wor will not worship, but they will remember and commemorate the different trumpets of the Old Testament. And there are a number of significant ones. Number one being Joshua's trumpet, right? And the walls came a tumbling down. They also, I think very significantly from a Christian perspective, will remember the ram's horn when the, he said the Lord will provide a sacrifice on this mountain. Of course, the ram's horn would have been made into that shofar, the trumpet. And also, most significantly, the silver trumpets of the sanctuary, which we'll look at in more detail, but I'll read it now. Numbers chapter 10, verses 2 through 3. The Lord told Moses, Make two silver trumpets. Of hammered work you shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for breaking camp. And when both are blown, all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And these, of course, would have been the trumpets that were blown on the day of the Feast of Trumpets. Now, these were lost at the temple's destruction with all of the other implements, of course, which only serves to highlight the pain of the Jews, that among the things you lost when you were scattered is you lost the thing that used to call you back together. And the Jews have been scattered from Israel until very recently. But now we are starting to see the children of Israel restored. The people are coming back into their land as was prophesied. So you might say that the gathering together of the people is beginning to be fulfilled again. And if, the, if we've been living in the summer of the church age, that it's starting to cool off a little bit. And the culmination of the process, of the trumpets being blown, at least I think from Paul's perspective, is the rapture of the church. If the last significant thing to happen in salvation history was Pentecost, what's the next thing we're waiting for? The rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall all be changed. In that chapter, I've already referenced, I think, two or three other festivals that Paul was pondering as he wrote that chapter. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. When Paul thought of the Lord rapturing his church, bringing them together, he was thinking it, about it in terms of trumpets. What were the trumpets for? They were to call God's people together. God, when that happens, he will call home the Jews. We're seeing the first parts of that now. And he'll call home the church. That's the next thing in God's plan. When the trumpet will sound, I, I love this. Whoever is teaching our children's ministry, you guys are doing an outstanding job. The reason I say that is because I was eating dinner with my sons and daughter the other night, and Colt sat up and said, Dad, I can't wait for the last trumpet. I said, why is that? He said, because that's when the, I forget what it's called. <laughs> and Micah said, rapture. And Cole, that's when the rapture is going to happen and God is going to take us all up to heaven. I'm like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> My little boy is sitting there during dinner. You wonder what kids are thinking sometimes. He was sitting there thinking about the rapture. I love it. That's what's next in God's plan, the fulfillment. The first three have been fulfilled. We're waiting for the next three to be fulfilled. Now, let me just make a real quick note here. There are some who say, okay, we know when in the year the Feast of Trumpets is supposed to happen. Month of Tishrei, right? It's supposed to be the, the first day of the month in the seventh month. So that's the day, whatever year, that's the day the rapture has to happen. Well, no. <laughs> Maybe, but Jesus said in Mark 13, 32, nobody knows the day nor the hour. And he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, no one knows the times or the seasons. So you don't know. But we do see from this that God has appointments to keep with humanity. And we better be ready for them. Are you ready? If Jesus were to come back today, would you be ready? And I might add, by the way, even if you do not hold as we do to a pre-tribulational rapture position, the sounding of the trumpet still inaugurates the return of the Lord. So you can still grab the symbolic significance out of this, even if you don't interpret it quite the way we would. Let's get on to the next one. Verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of the seventh month, so we did the first day of the seventh month, now we're on the tenth day of the same month, is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation. You shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord, and you shall not do any work on that very day. Here is another one. For it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening, there it is again, you shall keep your Sabbath. The fifth feast in our sequence is the Day of Atonement. Now, in chapter 16, we went over this ceremony in great detail, so I'm not going to go through all the details again. Uh, but this is what is known in Hebrew and is still spoken of today as Yom Kippur. This means the Day of Atonement. And this would be celebrated on the 10th day of the month of Tishrei, nine days after Rosh Hashanah. So this is going to be a Sabbath rest. This is the fifth special Sabbath day here. Instead, it says they were to be afflicted. Now, what this has been traditionally interpreted, and I don't see any reason not to, is that this was a day of fasting for the people. So this isn't just a day off. This is a very solemn day where you are to be fasting. And that's still what is done today. You also have the offerings that were lifted up in Leviticus 16. This is when the ceremony of the scapegoat was done. Remember that one? You had the two goats. One was sacrificed. One was sent off into the wilderness. And this is when you had the sprinkling of the blood on the Ark of the Covenant, which was the high point of the book of Leviticus. Now, traditional Judaism today describes these, these days, this one and the previous one, very differently. They see Rosh Hashanah as the day when God's book of life is opened. And on Yom Kippur is when he closes it. And you have ten days in which you are to be righteous and contemplative and think on your sins and feel sorry for them so that God will write your name down in the book of life. 
Now, whether this is taken symbolically or quite literally will depend on, on the synagogue that you're talking about. Because you have to reinterpret it because the Day of Atonement was all about blood being sacrificed. And the rabbis concluded, well, since God destroyed the temple, there must not be any need any longer for sacrifices. So all we have to do is think about it and feel bad for ourselves. They are right in that there is no longer a need for sacrifice. But they are wrong in thinking that they do not still need the blood to cover their sins. How can you conclude that? We talked about this in chapter 16. The center of chapter 16, the center of Leviticus, the center of the Torah itself is the sprinkling of the blood in the holy place. Leviticus 16, 14, and 15. That's the whole point. That is how we can dwell with God. If you do not believe that Jesus was that for you and you do not have the opportunity to do it, how in the world can you conclude that you have been atoned for? The writer to the Hebrews, of course, this is New Testament, but he was a Jew writing to Jews. Hebrews 9.22, he said, Under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. He's not innovating there. He's reminding them of what the law has already said. The reason there are no more sacrifices is because Jesus Christ is the final sacrifice for sins. Once for all, remember? Remember? But we look back on, on our day of atonement when Jesus died once for all. And the hard truth is that Israel has not received their atonement yet. Romans eleven twenty five. 25, Paul said, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Partial hardening has come upon the Jews. This is what Jesus pronounced upon them when they rejected him, when he knew they were going to reject him that week. And we say, is there ever going to be a day when they're welcomed back into God's family? There sure is. After the trumpet, we talk about trumpets, right? After the church has been raptured, we believe, the world enters seven years of great tribulation. Jeremiah 30, verse 7 calls this the time of Jacob's trouble. So who's, who's the tribulation focusing on primarily? Jacob, which is another name for Israel. Scholars in this room, I like that. When God will afflict the world. I find it significant that he says you must be afflicted during this time. In those seven years when we see the fulfillment of this feast is when the world will be afflicted. Especially Israel, who will not only face the, the trouble that comes upon all the world, but will specifically be singled out by the Antichrist for destruction. We talk about Armageddon sometimes, right? We say, oh, Armageddon has come like the end of the world, but you do realize that Armageddon is when the, it's really not one battle, it's a campaign of battles, you might say, where the Antichrist first crushes his enemies and then turns around and at the peak of his power says, now where are those Hebrews hiding? He marches on Jerusalem, he marches on the place in the wilderness where they're hiding, and that is when the children of Israel will cry out for Messiah's help for the first time. The hardness will be lifted from their hearts. And they will cry out to their, mess their Messiah saying, we need your help now. Hosanna, right? Save us now. And Zechariah 12, verse 10, and then I'll read verse 13, chapter 13, verse 1. I will pour out on the house of David in that day, in the context he's describing when all of Israel is surrounded and they're about to be destroyed. He says, then I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace. And please for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. They're going to realize we killed Messiah. We were waiting for him, and we killed him. And then we spent thousands of years completely redefining our religion to reject him. But then chapter 13, verse 1, On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. The atonement will be applied to their hearts. And that's when Jesus rides in and wins the battle of Armageddon. Not much of a battle. It says he's going to strike down the Antichrist with the sword out of his mouth. I don't know exactly what he's going to say, but it's going to be enough. And he'll rescue Israel in that day. So the fulfillment, we say, well, we've received the atonement. Jesus died once for all. He's not going to die again, 
but they're living on the outside of it. The very people that God raised up to bring about the Messiah, they're missing out on it. When will they finally receive the fulfillment of their atonement? It's when they are face to face with total annihilation. And the Lord will lift his hand. Right now, according to Hosea chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 23, they dwell in desolation without a priest, without a tabernacle, without an ephod. Jesus said, your house is left to you desolate. But Romans eleven twenty six 26 says, all Israel will be saved. Isn't that great? All of it. That have survived to the end. To rece- I mean, What's that going to be like? You ever, you don't, do you remember when you got saved? And maybe the preacher was preaching or somebody was talking to you or you heard on the radio. And for the first time, like, you felt like you woke up and you're like, well, I need to get saved. What am I doing? I, I got to get saved now. That's what's going to happen to this whole nation. And the Bible says there are going to be 144,000 Hebrew witnesses speaking to the world. I imagine that they'll be speaking. And man, you talk about altar calls. You talk about a whole nation coming to the Lord. And they'll cry out to Messiah Jesus. And he's going to come riding out of the clouds to rescue them in that day. All Israel will be saved. Well, after that, what's left? The fulfillment of the sixth feast here. Verse 33 to verse 43. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, on the 15th day of this seventh month. So we had day one, day 10, now day 15 of month seven. And for seven days is the feast of booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. Sixth special Sabbath. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. That is our seventh special Sabbath day. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each on its proper day. By the way, Numbers 28 and 29 outline the sacrifices that were to be offered during each of these festivals. Besides the Lord's Sabbaths, and besides your gifts, and beside all your vow offerings, and besides all your freewill offerings, which you give to the Lord. On the 15th day of the seventh month, When you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. You shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. This is the sixth of the feasts and the seventh moed in this chapter, seventh appointment. The Feast of Tabernacles. The ESV has the Feast of Booths, but I like Tabernacles better. So that's what we're going to call it. It's the same word, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's also called in other places in the Bible, the Feast of Ingathering. It's all the same thing. The Hebrew word is Sukkot. One of those booths that they would made was called a Sukkah, and the plural of that would be Sukkot. In case you're wondering, Im in Hebrew is the masculine plural. Ot is the feminine plural. So Sukkot. Tabernacles. This is on the 15th day of month seven. So this is five days after Yom Kippur. The first and the seventh days are Sabbaths. Now they were to take these leafy branches, they were to celebrate them with them, and they were also to build their Sukkot with them. They were to build a little hut that they would dwell in. And you say, why would they do that when there's a perfectly good house? Because they are remembering their wanderings in the wilderness. When they built tents and they dwelt in little huts, that's what they had. So God is telling them once a year, well, for a week, every year, you're going to live in those things again as a celebration. This was not a solemn occasion like the Day of Atonement. This was a celebratory thing. Tabernacles, along with Passover and the first fruits, were the required feasts. Exodus chapter 23 talks about the three feasts that every Hebrew male had to come to. One was Passover, the other was first fruits, and the other was tabernacles. Now remember, Passover and first fruits were only two days apart from one another. 
So this was two times a year when they were to come to Jerusalem. One in the spring, one in the fall, six months apart at the barley and wheat harvest, and then at the end of the year when they brought in the rest of the harvest. Now, what they would do, and we're going to get into some of the traditions here that are right in along with what this chapter says, they would gather in the temple, they would wave the branches, and these bounds of branches were called lulav. And they would wave them around, and they would sing on the Feast of Tabernacles, Hosanna, which, if you know your Bible, comes from Psalm 118. Now, if you've read Psalm 118, it's a psalm of deliverance. It's a ta- psalm of exalting the nation. And for that reason, the lulav, those bounds of palm leaves, became the symbol of the Maccabean revolt. That was the day when Hosanna, when God saved us, when God raised up Mattathias and Judas Maccabee, who cast off Greece. They were fighting priests. Judas Maccabeus was named Judas the Hammer. He was a fighting priest. And they cast off Greece, and this is where the the Feast of Hanukkah comes in, if you know that story. And they used as the symbol of the nation moving forward when they cast coins. And later on, that these lulav were not just celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, but this rebellion. So it was a sign of deliverance, not just of provision through the wilderness. Now, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday... What did they do? They started shouting Hosanna and waving Lulav. Now listen, this was not the season for that. So why are they doing this? Because as you know at this point, I just described, this had become much more of a political and nationalist symbol. And they say, hey, if this is the guy, who cares if it's not the Feast of Tabernacles? Let's celebrate anyway, because that's what it represented to them. So you understand that now, why it's all tied together. But Jesus did some very significant things in his life during the Feast of Tabernacles, which are instructive for us. In John chapter 7, Jesus was having dinner with his family, James and Jude and Mary and all the rest. And Jesus' brothers started taunting him. If you're such a big shot, why don't you go on down to the feast and let everybody know who you are? Or are you scared that the Pharisees are going to going to go after you. Oh, you're fine to preach up in Galilee and Samaria where they can't get at you. But if you're a prophet... Big brother, get down there and let them know. And from that moment on, it says that Jesus didn't see them anymore. And this is also, it seems in the scripture, when Mary started traveling with Jesus. So it could have been that there was a major rift in the family. But the reason they were fighting was because they were taunting him about going down to the Feast of Sukkoth, the Feast of Tabernacles. This is where Jesus said, I'm not going down yet, but I'm going to go down later. Why did Jesus go later? Because he was going to make a dramatic entrance, as God often does. Now, in order to get this, you've got to know some of these traditions, which are totally accessible to you. You can go look them up. What they would do every day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the priest would take a golden pitcher. He would go down to the Pool of Siloam. He would fill it up with water. And he would come back to the temple. And at this point, all the people are shouting and celebrating and waving the branches and singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he would pour out the water next to the altar so that it would flow. It was to remember how God gave them water from the rock in the wilderness. And they would do this every day. Now on the seventh day, they would do it seven times. And this was called the great day of the feast. Now knowing that, there's probably a verse sticking in your head here. Knowing this ceremony, it's a feast of Sukkoth. Everyone is there. They're celebrating the harvest. They're waving the branches. They're shouting, Hosanna, save us, Lord. They're pouring out the water. Seven times they pour this golden pitcher full of water out. And then in John 7, 37, it says, On the last day of the feast, in parentheses there, of tabernacles, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, Let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus was like asking for it here, wasn't he? Which is why you wonder, why are they trying to kill him? Because he's doing stuff like this. They're having this very celebratory moment. They're remembering how God provided water in in the wilderness. And this guy from Nazareth stands up and says, it's all about me. And they're like, we've got to do something about this guy. And they said, go send the soldiers. And the soldiers are like, we can't arrest him. Have you heard him preach? 
But he's standing up and calling the, the attention to himself. The other thing they did during the Feast of Tabernacles was every night they would set up 75-foot candlesticks in the court of the women. This is where all the Jews could come in. And they would have to climb up, the men, and, and light these things. And they would do it every night and keep them lit. And I believe it was um, Josephus who says, or maybe it was from the Talmud, one of the two, who said, no man has known joy until he's been there for that celebration. It was a beautiful day. And they would light these things up. Well, you know what else happens in John 7 and 8? Now, in John chapter 7, Jesus announces, come to me and drink. And then in John chapter 8, verse 12, still at the feast, what does he say? Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. <laughs> Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And here's what I think. So there was a, this is how they ended the day. Sometimes you've been to like uh, maybe a fireworks show or something when they have all the lights down and then that's kind of how they end with a big crash. They would end the Feast of Tabernacles at night by extinguishing all the lamps at once. That was kind of the way of, all right, party's over. Praise the Lord. We're going to go home now. I think that it was right at that moment that Jesus said that. I'll bet you they extinguished the lamps. It's pitch black. There's kind of that moment of quiet before everybody starts to talk again. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Again, you're thinking, Jesus, you're drawing a lot of attention to himself. By the way, so much for his brothers who said he was afraid, right? <laughs> you're afraid to let people know who you are? Jesus is like, why don't you come to the feast and see what happens, fellas? <laughs> Jesus said, you're waiting for the water of life. I can give that to you. You're looking for light in the darkness. I am the light in the darkness. I am the one who delivered you through the wilderness. Paul would say later that the rock that gave forth water was Christ. That pillar of fire that led them through the wilderness, Jesus says, that's me. He still is. They were waiting. All that celebration was looking for the one that would lead them out of the wilderness of bondage to Rome and into the kingdom. And that's God's final appointment. His final moed is to establish the kingdom. If the day of atonement will be fulfilled when Israel cries out to their Messiah, the next thing that happens is Christ will rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. And you know why we know that this is how it's going to be fulfilled? Because Zechariah specifically tells us that the entire world will be coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Sukkoth, the Feast of Tabernacles, during the millennium. Zechariah 14, verses 16 and 17. This comes right after what we read before, where God pours out a spirit of grace and repentance on them. Then, everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. By the way, they weren't supposed to worship the king. So why are they identifying their king with the Lord of hosts? Christology. And to keep the feast of booths. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So during the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ, when it says he will rule with a rod of iron, it's either you come to Jerusalem and remember the wilderness of history that I brought everybody through, or it's not going to rain. Jesus is going to enforce righteousness because the kingdom will have come. The year of history will be completed and everyone will be bowing the knee to Messiah Jesus. Old and New Testament will have been consummated in Christ. And that's the only thing that remains is the new heavens and the new earth where God's got, I'm sure, all kinds of new stories to tell. Revelation 21, 23. So this is describing heaven now. Are you with me? The new Jerusalem, he says, the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Amen. I am the light of the world. In Revelation 22, verse 1, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The heavenly images of Revelation draw from the feasts and festivals of the Old Testament law as they are all fulfilled and brought to completion in Christ Jesus. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feasts of the Lord. There's a line in one of David's psalms, Psalm, psalm 65, 11. He tells the Lord, you crown the year with your bounty. That's kind of what we're describing, isn't it? God crowns the year. God brings it all together. Let's review what we've looked at. The Sabbath, the first moed, the first appointment, is fulfilled through finding rest in Jesus. And you might say the Sabbath rest is the fulfillment of all these things. 
And we're going to see the Sabbath year and the year of Jubilee are both fulfillments of that Sabbath rest in Christ. But then there's the two sets of three. In the springtime, you have Passover, the crucifixion. You have the Feast of First Fruits, the resurrection. The Feast of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. And then there's the long summer in which we live when the harvest was worked and the fields are being labored in, until the harvest comes. And then you have the Feast of Trumpets, the rapture, the return of the Lord. The Day of Atonement fulfilled at the Battle of Armageddon. And the Feast of Tabernacles, which is fulfilled in the millennium, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through these feasts and festivals, God was remembering the past, solemnizing the present, and anticipating the future. And you and I live in the fullness of these things. We are very, very blessed people. I told Micah the other day, he said, I've been really lucky today. I said, don't say lucky. He said, what do I say? He said, how about blessed? Okay, I've been very blessed today. We don't believe in randomness. We believe in our Lord providentially overseeing our lives, right? So we're not lucky to live now. We're blessed. Well, what about these feasts then? Are we supposed to keep them? Let me remind you of what Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says. Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. What does that mean? If you want to, knock yourself out. But don't come around telling somebody they've got to do this to be saved or to be a good Christian. If you are in Christ, you are experiencing the fullness of these things day by day. The scriptures and the gospel. And then we see even the traditions of men all point to Jesus, the Holy One of Israel. Amen. And you and I, I, I can't get over this. I, I kind of realized it today and I can't stop thinking about it. You have, the, you have the springtime feasts and the autumn feasts. And you and I are living in the summertime. And Jesus compared it to what? Working in the fields, Amen. waiting for the harvest. The reapers are the angels. We're waiting for the Lord to do that. But I'll tell you what. That Feast of Trumpets, when the Lord gathers his people back. If we're living in the summertime, we're, we're waking up in the morning and going, ooh, might be hoodie weather today. <laughs> Jesus is coming soon. He's calling his people back to their land, and the next thing to happen is the trumpet to sound and call us home. So brothers and sisters, get out in the fields and work the harvest, especially those of the house of Israel, because they are partially hardened in their hearts, but who knows if the one you're speaking to might not be set aside by the Lord for salvation. Preach the gospel. Everything and every person finds its completion in Christ Jesus. I hope you found yours. If you haven't, then we want to introduce you to the one who is the centerpiece of all civilization and all salvation history. If you'll put your faith in him, all of the fullness and beauty and joy of the year of our Lord 